Imagine a world with no cold calling. A world where companies don't sell your data to other companies who want to pester you. At G4 Claims, we don't cold call and we don't buy a single lead from data companies. Oh, and if you're due any compensation from your car accident, you pay nothing to us at all. For full accident management support, including motor replacement, repairs and personal injury compensation claims, just search G4 Claims today for help the way you want it. Welcome to this week's episode of the DW Podcast. Uh, I'm joined by Peter Hooten, front man off the farm, amongst many other things. Peter, thanks very much for, for coming on. Okay. How are you going? I'm okay, yeah. I'm, um, I'm, uh, it's a great time to be alive. Champions of England, eh? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously under strange conditions, but um, I still think we enjoyed it as much, you know, because, you know, it's... We savoured it really, you know, because it's been 30 years. But I mean, we haven't been, we've won a lot of trophies in those 30 years, just has never been the Premier League, you know. Exactly. Um, so it was like, it was almost like a lead weight around the club's neck, you know. Exactly. Um, and to do it with such style. And, you know, you got to remember that two years ago, Man City were getting um, claimed as the greatest team the world's ever seen, you know. Yeah. Even, you know, Matching maybe the Barcelona team with what the Ola had, you know. Exactly. So to actually blow them off the water and absolutely destroy them is no like competition, was there? There was none at all. You know, it was unbelievable. You know, and like um I think after last season we went so close. I mean, we actually inspired City to up the game, you know. Yeah. I don't think they've had much competition over the years, have they really, you know? Not at all. Uh, we inspired them to up the game. And uh, I thought this year they'd be, you know, up for it again. But they seem to like, but when we beat them in Anfield in November, they seem to buckle, you know. And no one's mentioned this, but if that if Klopp had done that, it would have been uh, Klopp's bottled it, you know. He, he's, he's, a, he's a loser, loser pool and all that. No one said that about Guardiola, you know. Yeah. And I wouldn't particularly say about it because I don't think he has. I just think we've been so much better than him. He's just accepted it, you know. Aye, exactly. exactly. Uh, but I think they were still devastating going forward, City. But obviously, since they lost company, you know, it was a big, you know, a big gap in the defence, you know. But Liverpool probably haven't played as well this year as last year or last season, but have been more efficient, been more relentless, you know. What's it been like around the city in the past few weeks then, Peter? Has it been chaos? Yeah, it's been great, you know, but obviously you can't celebrate properly, you know, and you've probably seen a few news reports of uh, people breaking the lockdown or whatever, but sure. the government broke the lockdown, didn't they? So Aye, what do you expect? It's like the government said, pubs can open, you know, so <clears throat> people have voted with the feet, but I'm involved in the spirits of Shankly, the fans' union, you know, so... We were always saying that um, <clears throat> the people who went to the pier head, which is like Liverpool's uh, waterfront, sure. I think they reckon there was 7,500 there at the most. When Liverpool won the Champions League last season, uh, there was 750,000. So it's 1%. And it's mainly young kids, you know, and you can't blame them, really. I mean, the only problem was that someone was setting off these stupid fireworks, you know, which like that, eh? almost like bombs, you know. On the uh, library building or something like that, wasn't it? Yeah, because that's you know, it was it was it was lit up blue, wasn't it? Because of the Armed Forces Day or something. But it's also it's also the um, Everton Everton's owner now owns the library buildings as well. I so it's regarded, it. yeah, it's regarded unofficially as Everton's HQ, even though it's not, you know what I mean? There's loads of other businesses there, but so um, I think people just thought it was a laugh, you know, but then, you know, um, it made the news, you know, and uh, without the fireworks, it would have been 10 seconds on the news, you know? Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm not condoning it, but I'm just thinking it's got to be put in perspective, you know? Yeah. I mean, as you said, it's lots of young 
young kids as well, or young adults. And you know, like for yourself, you've seen Liverpool. Some of my mates, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, we were especially Shankly. We'd said, you know, don't don't go outside the ground, don't go to any congregation. So um, we didn't go, you know. But you know, we saw footage of it. Uh, and as I say, one percent. You know, I was going to get that. I'm sure once uh, once this is all over, you'll have a proper celebration as well. Eh? That's what Clock kept on saying, and that's what um, the club kept on saying, and the players. But even so, when we won the league, um, well, when when we were presented with the trophy on Wednesday, I think about three thousand went outside the ground. But you know that I you and that that's nothing, you know. That and lots of them are families with the kids because they probably don't get the chance to go to Anfield. You know, yeah. they wanted to be. I think it was more dangerous being in a pub nearby because the pubs were packed, you know. Yeah. But I'm not a scientist. I thought that, uh, I thought the, the, the celebrations in the telly the other day was, it was great to see, but it was bizarre. You know, it was really strange. Yeah. Left in it the was pool. bizarre because um, the Premier League took over it. Mm-hmm. So Liverpool, I would have thought, you know, should have been going up to Rostam to, you know, Fields of Anfield Road. Yeah. Um, he ain't heavy. He's my brother. We did for Hillsborough, number one, Christmas number one, a few years ago, and he never walked alone. But instead, it was Kanye West and Coldplay. But that's obviously an outside company coming in, isn't it? Yeah. You know. And listen, we, we, what we, can we, you do? It's the, it's the type of thing that you hate when you go to cup finals, where you have all the razzmatazz, and you know, I just want to hear the crowd singing. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want to wait. I don't want to be drowned out by absolute uh, corporate bollocks. You know, and I think that Liverpool's got this famous history, and like the <laughs> the club is so you know tied in with the music scene as well. You know, as you yeah. say, there's, there's so many songs that are synonymous with Liverpool. To hear these you know, corporate, as you say, it's corporate rubbish. It's what is going on. Yeah, well, it's it's it, you know the fan culture, you know, is strong. So why not celebrate that? But obviously. Some of them, the Premier League thinks we've got to appeal to India, China, you know, wherever, like yeah. the Far East, the Middle East. So, you know, but I, I mean, mate, but they'll all, you know, you never walk alone was played, wasn't it, at the end? So, you know, I suppose there was a compromise there, you know. Do you feel Liverpool is one of the last big football clubs that hasn't totally caved to this whole Asian market modern <laughs> football thing? Even when you look at, it's hard to say. When you look at Madrid last year, Peter, and you've seen, you know, all the, all the musicians playing out in the, the big square out there and it's packed. I can't imagine many other Premier League clubs having something similar to that. No, but that's all come from grassroots stuff, you see, and then it becomes so big in the grassroots and in pubs and clubs in town yeah. that the club... I mean, the one thing about Liverpool Football Club is they have got their ears to the ground because they've got people on the, who are employed by them who know the score. Right. Um, and they've got a fan liaison... Uh, officer called Tony Barrett used to be a time used to work for the time he used to work for the Liverpool Echo right. then he went to the Times and now he's a fan liaison officer so he'll tell them all what, what goes on yeah. so there's a lot few people get on guitar and uh, and you know get on stage in town and these are for people who can't get in the ground right because you've got to remember most most you know <clears throat> 16 to 25 year olds don't get in the ground. They, you know, they well, can't get tickets. They can't get tickets, you know. And they might get the odd season ticket passed down by parents or whatever. But it's very hard for them to get into the ground. So their culture has been in clubs in town, you know. Yeah. So when the match, big matches are on, you get certain uh, <clears throat> acoustic guitarists get up. And it's a bit like Jerry Simon in a way, you know, that type of thing, you know. I, I think I've listened, listened to a lot of Jamie Webster, and I think him and Jerry are very similar. They are, yeah, they yeah. are, yeah. Um, so obviously Jerry, he's, he's massive, isn't he? And he's done a, seems to have done it on his his own, and you know, all credit to him for yeah. doing that. But there's this culture around the club, which yeah, I think it's pretty unique. You know, um, it is unique because it's it's independent, but then the club. They don't try and control it. They just, like in Madrid, they will, will have had a stage there, you know, but they, they have all the ones who are playing to 500 people every week rather than getting in Jerry Marsden or or people right. like that, you know. It's good to see that, you know, 
Carragher and a lot of the ex-players get involved as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's it. It's, it's one of those situations, isn't it, where, you know, um, um, I think people, when when they've been players at the club and they can't, you know, they still feel part or want to feel part of it. So, yeah, when, <clears throat> even though, like, say, Jan Mulvey and people like that who came over, they end up staying here, you know. <laughs> they end up staying in Liverpool and I think it's got, <clears throat> it's probably a bit like, you know, places in Scotland where people are attracted to the warmth of the people, you know, and, yeah. uh, you know, Rafa Brita still lives here. It's mad, eh? He still lives here, even though he's been all around the world. Yeah. He's still got a house on the Whittle. Oh, really? um, he lives in Liverpool and, you know, obviously Dag Leash and people like that still live here and Hanson. That, that, was, cool. that was one of the highlights think, for me, Peter. We've seen how delighted Ken Kenny was as well at the celebrations, you know? Yeah, was... yeah. I think Kenny stayed here because it's got good golf clubs, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't be surprised at that. But uh, how does Klopp compare to the likes of Shankly then? Is he is he almost at that stage? Klopp. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's getting there. Yeah, he's certainly. Um, you know, I think certain people who are, you know get what what the club's about, and yeah. Klopp is one of them. Uh, you know, and he he he's genuine. You see, you, what you see is what you get. He's authentic. Talk to any journalist. And there's something recently on Football Focus about him going to his old town where he yeah. and his old clubs, and then they're saying he's exactly what he's like on the telly. That's him, and everyone says the same. And that was like that's the way Shankly was. Some yeah. managers put on a, a public face for the camera, you know, mm-hmm. uh, but he, he doesn't, you know. And I think he comes out with the right things at the right time. Yeah. His, his sayings are fantastic, and his mo is natural. And Shankly always used to talk about. Natural enthusiasm, and that's what Klopp's got in abundance. Natural enthusiasm for football. It's not an act. It's not a way of making money. It's he just loves football, yeah. and everyone can see that. You know. How long did you think that's why with Brendan Rodgers, people never really took to him? Yeah. You know, although you know he split the crowd anyway. Fifty mm-hmm. percent thought he just read a book on Shankly and came out with what he wanted to wear, and fifty percent. Uh, was saying no, no, he's genuine, he's genuine. But then there was other things going on in his private life that you're thinking, wait there, you know. I mean, Klopp's had his teeth done. Has he? Brendan had his teeth done. Right. <laughs> but everyone commented on it because of, um, you know, because he left his wife and went off with someone from the club and that, you know. So it's it's a bit different, you know. Klopp seems to be, you know, he's obsessed with football, you know. Uh, no, I'm saying Brendan Rodgers isn't, but I just thought half the crowd thought he was a bit of a phony, you know. I think it's interesting, no one isn't that? Because the same things happened up here in, in Glasgow with the Celtic fans. When when he first came in, it was very much uh, Celtic fans were delighted, you know, it's boyhood team, he's back, and then he, he was out the yeah. door as quickly as he could possibly be when he got a, a sniff of the Premier. Yeah, you know? I think he was the way he left. Yeah, it was the way he left, wasn't it? I think that lacked a bit of class, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't think the likes of Klopp would have done that, you know. Yeah. I don't think that's in his makeup to do that, you know, because Klopp's so confident in his own ability, he would have thought, let the Premier League wait. Hey. How long think, do you reckon he'll stick around for, Peter? Uh, I think <clears throat> he signed till 2020, um, but then um, he signed an extension of two years, which is unusual, you know, because... Everywhere he's been, Mines, he was seven years at Mines, seven years at Dortmund, and it was looking like he was going to be seven years at, at Anfield. So that would have been, you know, another couple of seasons. But everyone's thinking, oh, you know, can we signed this extension. So he might, he might, um, he might, he might stay to 2024. If he does, I think the next four years, you know, as long as everything gets back to normal with, um, with the pandemic, you know, I think, I can see us going from strength to strength, you know. But I think we need the crowds back. 100%. I think you know, we need the crowds back because obviously, um, you know, our dominance at Anfield is based upon the crowd as well, you know. Yeah, totally agree. What, what's your thoughts then? Every single Liverpool team seems to have a, a famous Scotsman in it as well. I'm 
I'm taking some yeah. partial, partial credit for the success. Well, that's what we always said over the years. You know, we have you know, since the uh, the great teams of the seventies and eighties, we we lack that um, that Celtic heart, really. You know, um, and Robert Robertson, you know, he's got it. And when he first came, Klopp wasn't playing him. You know, he, he was he was. He was in, you know, he was on the bench for months, and everyone thought, "Oh, he mustn't fancy him, he mustn't fancy him." And then when he when he started playing, no one was getting that position off him. He's an absolute warrior. He's unbelievable. He's he's the nearest thing I'd say to. He's uh, Joey Jones who used to play for Liverpool, left back, but a lot more talented. Mm. So he's got the he's got all the attributes um, of a classic left back. You know, because he gets down the wing, he's got a good cross on him, distribution's good, and he fights like a terrier, you know. So he's probably one of the best left backs I've seen in Anfield, yeah. if not the best. It's been great to see his success as well, because he just seems like such a professional, you know. It's, and his, his yeah. story from working in the Tills and Marks and Spencers and playing with Queen's yeah. Park to <laughs> winning the Champions League is, you never it's hear that anymore. You never it's a that. dream. Yeah. It's dream come true stuff, isn't it? You know, exactly. Fantasy, you know, really. <laughs> what about yourself, then, Peter? What was your your earliest memories of growing up in Liverpool and, and going to Anfield, and then obviously um, with your, your career, then getting into music? <clears throat> just, uh, I always remember um, just going. First memories were football, really, from me childhood days. Obviously, going to church as well. You know, my mum take me to church. I'd sing at the back of church, you know. Uh, much to the annoyance of the priests, <laughs> you know, but uh, uh, looking back on it, I'm glad I annoyed them, you know. But uh, <laughs> football, yeah, I was from an early age, I was just obsessed with football, you know. Um, and really started going at an early age, but uh, um, my dad used to take me, my dad uh, worked with a fella called Ray Shelley, and Ray Shelley's dad was a, a trainer called Albert Shelley. And Albert Shelley was one of the boot room boy type situations, you know. He, he's not famous as such because he retired in the fifth, 1950s, but he carried on working for the club for years, like as a volunteer, you know, yeah. one of them. Um, so he was the trainer. So my dad knew his son. So we'd get him tickets for the obstructed view, you know. So my earliest memories were obstructed view at Anfield in the main stand. My dad had a season ticket. In the early 60s in um, the Cameron Road. But if you ever got tickets off this Ray Shelley, uh, he'd take me. So I always remember, I was always fascinated. The cop was to the right of you. So you're right looking at the cop, um, right in the corner, looking at the cops just to the right of you. And I was always obsessed with the, the cop as much as the game, you know, uh, and the songs and thinking, you know, one day I can go in there. You know, that's all I was thinking of, you know. Mm -hmm. And one day I did go in there. <laughs> Never I've been a season that. ticket holder there, you know, since the uh, early 90s, you know. It's funny that you say that because I feel that kids nowadays, what, what's almost missing, missing a lot for the British game is, I remember when I was growing up similar to yourself and going to watch Motherwell, that you're actually more obsessed with the fans and the singing and the camaraderie than you are with the, the heroes on the pitch. And I think the more mm -hmm. that the atmosphere drops out, it's, it was almost like a lost generation, the people coming through. It's yeah, it is. But I think Scotland have got a... I mean, I went to a few games up there when me, me mate's uh, lads was playing. He was on loan from Everton. Um, uh, Conor Grant. Oh, no, aye, aye. He was a yeah, great midfielder, yeah. by the way. Yeah, he was, yeah. yeah. Well, he still is. He plays for Plymouth now. But we went to Motherwell and like, they had this bat load of kids in the corner yeah. with the drummer. We thought it was fantastic, you know, but I mean, I'm not sure what I'd like it at Anfield because I don't yeah. particularly like drums, you know, but... Uh, <laughs> it's interesting, Peter, because, I, I mean, personally, you know, I've always been in that corner and, and been involved with, with that, the kind of groups. And at first, when that was brought in at Third Park and in Scotland, people were thinking, what is going on here? You know, the fans are thinking, get that drum, fuck, get that. You know, and yeah. the more that it's built, people have taken to it. And, people and have taken to it. Yeah, I can understand that. I can understand this. Certainly... South American atmosphere, isn't it? You know, yeah. And you know, a lot of fans have adopted that culture, but 
I was pleasantly surprised when I, um, I was there. Mm-hmm. And they, was, they had a Beatles song that they were singing. Just they shout it with you know. Shout and I was just thought it was brilliant, you know. But you were you doing similar on the, in the cop, you know. I, I always remember looking at the old videos and probably when you were first starting to go to the cop and, you know, people are singing full length Beatles songs and, like, yeah, like harmonies almost. Yeah, I, I wasn't going up. I wasn't going in them days, but I've seen footage of it. Uh, but yeah, there's footage of them singing She Loves You. That's it. And also, um, anyone who had a heart by Silla Black with some bare back and axe on, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the cop is swaying and singing all the words. And, that, and it's just, it's magical to watch, you know. And I think, you know, music is still important, you know, it's still important for, uh, for, for fans, you know. And I think, you know, they'll adopt. They'll adopt, you know, um, popular songs for players' names, won't they? You know, and that's that's the way it should be. And everyone's always looking for the next big, you know, big song. I mean, I suppose um, at, at Anfield it was probably L.A. L.A. L.A., which was from a Italian disco hit from the eighties or something. Is that where that came from? That's eh? where it came from. Yeah, yeah. you know, and like a really Euro pop. Europe, yeah, yeah, yeah and it's like, but it works on an acoustic guitar, you know. Yeah. When, when uh, you and so, farm, yeah. When you were starting the farm, Peter, did you take much influence from football, or did you think did that then follow you? No, you know? we, we uh, I did a magazine called The End, which was very associated with football. It wasn't a football fans here, but it was a we tried to appeal to both Liverpool and Everton fans yeah. who went to away matches, you know who had a certain style of dress, you know, clothing and that. So we were definitely uh, um, writing for people who went to away matches. Uh, so when the farm started, I thought, I'd seen groups like, uh, I'd been to jam concerts where yeah. there'd been mayhem, you know. Mayhem. There was one in Deeside Leisure, which is in North Wales, you know. Right. And they had war and factions from Manchester, Liverpool, Deeside, North Wales. And I, I just thought, I'd hate to be in a group where Paul Weller's dad had to come out and say, if you don't stop fighting, it's going to be no oh, gig. Right. And I'd seen the Cockney rejects, what has happened to them, you know. Yeah. So I didn't want to be associated with one club, you know. I thought, I, I wanted the fan to appeal to everyone, you know. Mm-hmm. So we stayed away from football, really. I also remember going to a gig in Leeds and we were sitting in a pub opposite the venue. We've seen all these like young Leeds lads turning up, you know, but it was obviously their, the, you know, Leeds Savers crew or whatever they called. Uh, and I thought, oh no, they've come to get us. <laughs> and then I, went, I said to the, uh, one of the lads said, let's, let's go over and see, you know, start and find out why they're here, you know. And, uh, and when the, when the notices was over there, they said, oh, you're in the, you're in the farm, aren't you? And, yeah, yeah. And I said, what are you here for, lads? He went, oh, we've come to see you. Really? I said, oh, right. So then, you know, obviously we, everyone relaxed then, but it was all like the hooligan types and they come to see the farm. They also said, you, believe, you, you bring a coach sometimes, don't you? <laughs> but we'd stop the coaches. We'd stop coaches because we went to a... a a Redskins concert. We were supporting the Redskins in Birmingham. Right. And uh, it was a coachload of farm fans. They were all match types. And they, they got attacked by the Birmingham crowd. Right. And it was absolutely mayhem, you know. Um, we thought, we're not we're going to stop coaches now because it's not worth it, you know. We didn't want to become that yeah. group that you couldn't, uh, you know, we wanted people to unite through football, mm-hmm. not to start killing each other. It's an interesting point, though, because at, at that time when you were breaking onto the scene, you know, the, the mid to late 80s as well, I think, was it 83 that you first formed, Peter? Eight. Yeah, the, our first Peel sessions were 83. Yeah. But we spent about six years, like, getting nowhere, really, you know. just We had lots of A&R people coming to see us because we had a big following in Liverpool. And John Peel was playing us all the time, and he liked the stuff and various... DJs on Radio 1, you know, Janice Long and people like that. So the A&R people had come, and they, these were top people, you know, who were like he'd signed Paul Weller and various, you know, the House Martins, and the, and the stairs were asking, going, uh, well, where's your image? 
and we're going to dish his hair. And it's, you know, we had, I think, tweed jackets on or, mm. or cord jackets and uh, straight jeans and training shoes and cagoules and all that. Yeah. And it was the image the Oasis probably made, put mainstream, you know, but the record companies couldn't see it and said, well, that's not an image. We went, this is the most, this is, you couldn't get more omni appeal than this. And I think that's been proven in years gone. You know, every group now has got a cagoule on, haven't they? Yeah. Being yeah. apart from a few. Yeah, that's because, you know, people that were from Liverpool or from the North, Liverpool, Manchester, were ahead of the time that the A&Rs just couldn't keep up with that. Yeah, I just don't think, I think it was at the time when you had groups like, um, you know, Frankie Goes to Hollywood yeah. and everyone was dressing up and you had Boy George, you know, dead or alive, you know, and I think it, it was outrageous gear, you know, Spando Ballet. They, they didn't see ours as an image, you know, but I was trying to say to them, this would have people on council estates, you know, people, yeah. this is like, a, a, this is like, you know, um, you know, the history of the jam and the clash, this is the next step, you know, mm-hmm. and they couldn't see it. They only saw it when, I suppose, mm, uh, Stone Rose and Happy Mondays uh, got onto the top of the pops, and then it became it became obvious to record companies that that type of style was, you know, was was fashionable. You know, mm. I mean, I was oh, during the whole of nineteen ninety, we had the farm had more front covers than any other group in the country. We our press officer got an award for the most front covers, mm. but I was doing the most banal interviews about. You know, talking about training shoes and you know just things that I wasn't really that interested in. Mm-hmm. You know, even though I wrote an article on training shoes and people, because of that article, think I'm some sort of aficionado, but I'm not. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I've never claimed to be. But I was doing. You know, the face had four pages on the farm before they did a note. <laughs> it's just because we had stuff for the St George gear on and mm-hmm. and, and different shedding on leathers and that. And you know, and the uh, the bucket hats, you know, mm-hmm. and because he'd seen the Mondays and all that, <clears throat> and Sean Ryder admits this. He saw us on the Oxford Road Show about eighty four, eighty five, I think it was, and he was saying then, oh, you know, that's the type of image that yeah, that's it. If they can do it, we can. And he said he said that to me in the past. You know, it's actually there's something on YouTube with me and him in conversation where he's talking about it. You know. Yeah. Um, but at the time, 1990, there was lots of uh, jailers just wanting to know what's this called, what's it, and it never got a name. And now you get you see articles about baggy music, and mm-hmm. I hate it that way yeah. because we all had, we were like, we were uh, dressed in Paul Smith, yeah, and uh, and that type of gear. So we weren't in flares or baggy, you know, day glow jump. Or yeah, day- I- Better present, that, eh? We weren't that we were <clears throat> a lot more street like a neat, it was a neo mod look, really, for us. That's what we thought it was, anyway. The neo mod look, so I, h- I hated that lazy journalism, and it's still continuing to this day, yeah. you know. But um, it's people who don't understand it, you see, you know. Around about that time, uh, Peter, you know, it was obviously you, you spoke about there about the football fans in the terraces and getting into music, but it was. Mentioned 1990, and that was around about the Italian 90 stuff as well, wasn't it? And yeah. you guys became pretty synonymous for the No Alla Violenza t shirts as well. That's it. That's it. I mean, that was a massive t shirt, really, because it was so f- fashionable. I think it also the dark days of the 80s. I think obviously you'd had the Heysel tragedy, you'd had uh, Hillsborough, and I think generally people think, you know, there's a new decade coming, there's a new feeling, and obviously. The dance craze, ecstasy, uh, you know, a lot of football fans got into that. And it was, it was nothing, it was nothing to do with Margaret Thatcher, trouble f- stopping at the matches. It was basically uh, a change in society and a change in attitudes and, and culture, really. Mm. You know, and then I always remember when we were in London, we were in this club called the Limelight, which was a famous club on Shaftesbury Avenue. And we just been doing a recording session with Suggs, who was our producer. Yeah. And we said, let's go and see Teddy Farley, the DJ. He was playing in the limelight. Like, so we went in there. 
I walked in and uh, noticed about 20 lads in the corner who all looked like f- football, you know, casuals. That's what they called them in London. Like, well, I, we never called them casuals, you know. But anyway, anyway, one of them comes up to me and immediately I'm thinking, oh, no, the Nova Scouts is all right. <laughs> and he went, uh, all right, Scouts. He went, uh, how many of them, uh, how many of you are there, you know? And there's about seven or eight of us at the bar and a few more coming in. So I exaggerated saying about, about 20 of us. You know, I want to buy it all. I thought he was trying to find out how many to do was in, you know. And he said, I want to buy it all a drink. And he said, where are you? You know, we're in West Ham. You know, and like shaking my hands and all that. And it was then it was realised that people have been writing about it. But until you actually experience something like that. And we didn't accept a drink off. We said, no, there's too many of us now. Just leave it, man. No, we're not, you know, you're in the farm, I it was all that type of thing, you know. And um, it was real. It was real. I mean, obviously, I think it was induced by uh, um, DMA, you know, it was like ecstasy induced it. But people, humans had another side to them. It was peace and love, you know, but it wasn't peace and love on a hippie trip. It was like, this was working class culture, you know. Mm-hmm. Um and it's and just petty, that it, and it's funny the way that it's went from, you know, you, you had the, the football hooligan outbreak in the 80s and people were knocking lumps out of each other. Yeah. And then you had Thatcher obviously trying to shut this down, uh, going down hard on hooliganism. But then these people who are for working class council estates across the country then get into dance music. And yeah. they, were, they were all coming together. And then once the dance craze took off in ecstasy but on the scene, Thatcher tried to shut that down as well, you know. it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, well, they were trying to shut down anything that was seen as youth rebellion, weren't they? You know, mm-hmm. so it was. I went. I actually went to that rave that made the front pages of the of the new tabloids. Did you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and not by not by design. We were we had a gig in Redden that night, and then after the after the gig in Redden, uh, the promoter said, "I'll come to this party. It's it's a good party. My mates are putting on. It was like a reggae party." Yeah. And it was in a marquee in someone's garden, and it was brilliant, you know, great DJing, but it was all, it's mainly reggae and all that, it wasn't really dance music. Yeah. And anyway, we were going four o'clock in the morning, we decided, you know, told the driver we should go home, you know, <laughs> want to go home now, you know. So he pulled into a service station, and there was cars coming from everywhere, you know, with all people dancing in them. And not just, you know, 18 to 25, you know, there was fellas in the 50s dancing, you know. We thought we've got to follow these wherever these are going, so we followed them, and it was that rave. Really? Uh, and I think uh, there's only about there was six and six in the group then. I think there's only me and the drummer Roy went. The others fell asleep in the back, <laughs> and they missed out on it. So, but we went to it, and it, we were there till like five, six, seven in the morning, you know. And it was like in a in a aircraft hangar. Right. It was absolutely bedlam, you know. And it was, you know, it, it, it was an experience. I wouldn't say I enjoyed it. <laughs> but you could see, you can think, there's no stopping this. Mm-hmm. You'd have to, the police will have to like put roadblocks and stop this. It's, it was, you know, it was a, it was a people's movement. You know, I feel that the farm almost crossed those divides, though. You know, you you could cross into the indie scene, but also the dance scene as well. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, we we all saw uh, our mentors were big audio dynamite. It wasn't really the Manchester scene. I always dispute that. We were trying to be, or we, we'd seen what Mick Jones had done with dance music, coming out the Clash, and the big audio stuff, equal MC squares and uh, the bottom line and all tracks like that. And we were obsessed with it. I went to see them in Liverpool. Uh, about 86, 87, I think it was. And he, they played um, 10 Upping Street, you know, and the album, and it was all samples. And they were using samples on stage and spaghetti westerns. And I just thought, this is the future of music, sampling stuff. And so I've become a bit obsessed with it. So that's what we tried to incorporate. But we couldn't, it wasn't until about 89 that we could afford a sampler because they were dead expensive in them days, you know. Yeah. And then uh, we got money from a, for a sampler off uh, one of the lads who being seen us in concert. But he, he'd said to a mate of a mate saying, you know, why aren't the farm successful? 
and I said back to him, said, economics, we haven't had the money to buy the equipment we need, you know. Mm. And he said, oh, I'll lend you some money, you know. and that's how it all started, really. That's amazing. And then did you get... And he wasn't. Uh, he was the grandson of the Moores family. Right. Barney Moores, his name was, and he was like... Uh, um, he was basically, uh, he was only about 19, 20 himself, but he was coming into money, you know, through the trusts. Mm -hmm. So he was willing to give us, he said, how much will it be to do an album, a couple of singles? And off the top of my head, I, I said, well, £25,000, you know. And he said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll lend you that. I said, well, what if we don't sell any records? He said, well, that's my risk, isn't it? He said, I think you will sell records. Within... Um, within nine months, we had Groovy Train top five, yep. uh, and we had Groovy Train top six, uh, and altogether now challenging for the Christmas number one. So it was like it's the Andy. It was Andy Robinson of music, you know. Mm -hmm. It was, was like <laughs> Andy Robinson. Of music. What was it like when you were challenging for the the Christmas number one? What was your your thoughts on that? Because I'd imagine you well, really back and thought we weren't really thinking about it because we weren't bothered really. And at the time, we were like, we'd be, um, the fellow who ran Godis, Andy MacDonald, he, uh, Chaz Smash, who was the dancer with Madness uh, and occasional singer, he, were, he, he was an A&R person at Godis. So he asked Suggs if he could come into the studio. And we didn't, wouldn't let anyone in, not even JLS, we wouldn't let anyone in. We were recording in Mayfair Studios in Primrose Hill. Before right. Primrose Hill became fashionable, you know. Uh, and we were recording there. So we let Chas Mash in one day. Just, you know, I said, but he can't, you know. And Chas Mash it all together now, like. Right? So we must have told Andy MacDonald. So Andy MacDonald pleaded with us to let him in to hear it, you know. So we let him in to hear it. This is about October 1990. And we played it. And he said, uh, that's a Christmas number one. And we said, oh, what do you think so? He said, yeah, if you, if you sign with me now, that's a Christmas number one. Yeah. And, we, and we said, yeah, but we've got our own record label. And it's the, the lads that had the money set it up with us, you know, we can't be doing that to them. We just signed to it. But no, you know, sign to me and I'll give you, sign to me and I'll give you a million pounds, he said. Advance, you know, on the, on the album. And we said, nah, you're all right. <laughs> We wanted to stay with our own independence. But he said, if you, if you come with us, we'll make sure it's Christmas number one. Because record companies at the time, had, they could do deals with shops. Uh, they could do two-to-one deals or three-to-one deals. So if the shop bought three, they'd get one free, you know, and they promote it more, you know. And there's all sorts of big major record companies knew how to do that. We were a small independent, didn't have any knowledge of the music industry, really. We were all learning you know, as we were going along, you know. But I think it was because the very fact that he thought he could just offer us money and we go, oh, yeah, we just went now, you know. If he hadn't have offered us money, he might have been more interested. Not because, you know, we would have said, look, I'll, I'll buy your indie label and, you know, come towards us. We might have done that. Mm -hmm. But he was saying, Le you know, leave produce records and I'll give you a million pound advance, you know. And uh, we were thinking... We must be looking back at it and thinking you must be mad mm -hmm. to have done that. But at the time, it seemed like the right thing to do. You know, do you think we were that was, do you think I mean, they were a major company, but yeah. we were against the. We, we we saw ourselves as the underdogs against the record industry. You see, so do you think of what that was to do with a, a Liverpool socialist upbringing that you thought we're we're no cave into this? You know, capital was giants here. I think it was. Yeah, I don't. I wouldn't say so. No, I think it was a. I think it was a case of loyalty. Mm -hmm. You know, but um, you know, we've two eighteen months later, we fell out with everyone anyway. So, and then we signed to Sony yeah. for you know for a big advance. You know, but that was because you know by that time we had twenty odd people on our payroll. You know. Mm -hmm. Suggs always said to us, whatever you do, lads, don't ever get your mates on the payroll. And that's what and you've we, done. No, we'd never do that. We'd never do that. <laughs> and we did exactly the same because that's what you do when you, you know, all this money's flooding in. You go on and you can see your mates who've, you know, helping you out on various things in the past. 
They say, oh, you should be paying them for doing this. Let's, you know, start paying them. Yeah. But I don't think it, no, I don't think it was, I don't think it was misplaced. I think it was, you know, it's probably, um, I think it was the right thing to do. It was, it was to keep the group together and to keep um, the organisation together, you know, because a few months later, then Spartacus went on to become number one, independent number one, you know. So an indie label had a number one, and it was a pure indie. It was on, it was getting distributed by Pinnacle, who were a pure indie label. A lot of a lot of indie groups at the time were getting distributed through London Records and through other basically major companies, you know. We did it all independently, you know. And remember Bill Drummond? Bill Drummond used to ring up the uh, produce record office and went, uh, you know, I've released a track and you're beating me again. How do you do it? Really? Because he was thinking there must be some musical guru behind these, <laughs> some musical mogul who knew everything. Yeah. But it wasn't. It was just spontaneity, you know. Hard work as well, Peter, I'm sure. Yeah, there was people who were working hard in the company, you know. There was lads who were, and girls who were, uh, you know, who'd never had any experience, but were like, you know. So people used to bring up produce records, trying to get, you know, the tapes listened to or the CDs listened to, and people had to go and go, what? <laughs> well, uh, can we speak to the air now? Like, oh, we haven't got one. <laughs> so where can we send tapes? He said, tapes for what? <laughs> You know, for, to sign us up, are you the A&R department? He went, listen, mate, I was putting the bits on the end of shoelaces two months ago. I don't know anything about the record. And he put the phone down. I reckon we probably upset everyone in the music business because journalists were doing that as well, you know. And mm-hmm. and they all, everyone saw it as a laugh, you know, a joke, you know. But we would, when you start employing people and you're on tour in America, it becomes serious then, so you you can't be you can't be still having a massive laugh about it. The the, the fun went out of it, really, you know. But when that Spartacus album gets to number one, and it's all your mates that have helped you get there, how, how do you celebrate that? It was a big party, was it? We were on tour, I think. We were in uh, Brighton, and we got a bottle of champagne off the uh, off the off the agent, I think it was, who was doing the tour. And uh, there's very low key celebrations because yeah, yeah. we were like, yeah, we. I think we would be, we weren't becoming blasé, but we were just becoming. I think we were exhausted, you know, mm-hmm. because we'd had a whole year of non-stop, you know, and yeah. um, I think we we decided we won't like, celebrate tonight. We'll celebrate when we're back in Liverpool. So we had a big get together then, you know. Yeah. But it was, uh, and also we didn't want to celebrate too much because you know it's not it's not what you do is it really I don't think you know yeah as a front man when, when you're recording with Suggs were you asking him for, for pointers he'd obviously been there and done it or were you doing your own thing or? the only pointers I'd asked Suggs for was there uh, which which is the uh, nearest pub which sells the best ale <laughs> that's what what we did most of our time was going to pubs and yeah. what we did have in the in the uh, studio was a massive Sabutio competition. Right. And that was taken more seriously than than anything, really, you know. So um, we'd all play Sabutio and, yeah, but Suggs, obviously, Suggs was very instrumental in uh, Terry Farley was very important as well because he'd be giving us drum loops and he'd be getting them from um, underground house tracks, you know. And it was funny. We went on tour with the Big Audio Dynamite um, in 1991, later on in the year. And we had this other group called um, Downtown Science on tour. So they'd go on first, Downtown Science, then The Farm, then Big Audio. And the fellow in Downtown Science was a lad called Sam Sievers. And he was basically a, a rhythm man, you know. And he'd done a lot of the rhythm tracks for Third Bass. Right. And other other groups from New York, you know. And uh, we were doing a sound check one day, and he called to us and said, uh, I recognize some of them loops. And we went, Oh, yeah, why? He, you know, do you know third bass? He went, I was in third bass. <laughs> he said, my drum loops. And there's about seven of them. <laughs> the album, you know. And we said, uh, How much do we owe you? And he went, No, I'm flattered, man. I'm flattered, you know. Flattered, That's all it is. You know. You know. 
Uh, so yeah, but anyway, yeah, back to the studio with Suggs. It was like, um, you know, say for say for example, all together now it used to be six verses, and he cut three out uh, to make it more of a pop single. You know, was that things hard like for you? Was, was that hard for you cutting three verses that you wrote? Or? Yeah, but it made sense, you know, and I don't miss them now. You know, don't miss them. But the, the other verse is more about the story about. Uh, uh, the, the the truce in no man's land, talking about Lord Kitchener and various um, things that went on in the House of Parliament. When the House of Parliament was saying, "What's happening on the Western Front? They're not fighting," you know, <laughs> questions in the House about it, you know. Yes. Uh, so yeah, but it, it, the gist of the song and its meaning was kept. But say, for example, Terry Farley, he'd say he'd suggest like. Um, on Groovy Train, where that guitar uh, bit at the start, that was a, originally a middle eight. Right. So he was saying, oh, I can hear that at the start, and that becoming the feature of the song. Right. And he was right, you know. So it was, it was it was a mixture of, you know, different great ideas, you know. Yeah. Sug spent more time going through the actual makeup of the songs and the lyrics. Yeah. But uh, it, Teddy Farley introduced the... Um, groundbreaking at the time I mean Stepping Storm was our first single and that used the power snap by the power right, okay. they'd got it from um, a 70s track called uh, Wait for the Mardi Gras I uh, forget the name of but anyway um, Teddy Farley brought this white label into the studio and went this is the biggest thing in, in London clubs at the moment this is the biggest track and it'll only ever be underground. He said, I can't see it going mainstream. And it was the da 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 it, da da it, that, that one. So we put it under Stepping Stone, slowed the track down, and put the song over it, and it worked, you know, it worked perfectly. Anyway, by the time we released Stepping Stone, the power was at number one on the official charts, you know, yeah. because obviously a record company had picked up on it, released it. But it was that type of... Um, suggestion from people that would probably have never come from the group, you know. Well, it wouldn't have come from the group, you know. So it was a, it was a jigsaw, really. It's interesting that you say that, though, because I feel that now, Peter, a lot of musicians, that they, they want to be seen as being original, but you guys are more than happy to take samples or take other ideas and make it your own. And Well, you know, most groups, uh, it's beg, steal and borrow, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. yeah. But they don't want to admit it. If you, if you listen to... Um, some of the early Beatles stuff, you know, it's all taken from the blues, you know, and I mean, a lot of them they were covering blues tracks, you know, yeah. but then they were taking riffs from blues tracks and the Stones and Led Zeppelin are famous for it, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's whole compilations of albums where they got their ideas from, you know. So, yeah, and even um, I always remember uh, Bowie said, uh, and it was just the day after the copyright had wavered about Starman, and he said, I got that off from The Wizard of Oz. Uh, and you'd never know it unless no. someone said. I never knew that story. Somewhere there's a star. And that's it. And he said, I got that from The Wizard of Oz. But he, he waited till the copyright had waned in America to admit it, you know. That's clever. And yeah. uh, I think that's, I think that's most groups will admit that, you know. What was it like when you guys were touring America? Because that was around about... 94 as well, wasn't it? The <clears throat> USA one? Uh, we toured America about three or four times, 91 to 94. Mm -hmm. Probably split the group up. <laughs> really? Yeah, probably did, yeah. Too much time I mean, together? You, you, it's, it's not as... Uh, I mean, we had some great times, but um, there's a lot of pressure on you, you know, because um, I was always worried my voice was going to go. Right. You know, you'd have three days on and a day off, and then three days on and a day off, and you were in usually in a tour bus, you know. And everyone's saying, "Oh, well, you know, it's not really hard work, hard work," but you know. But, but Keith, our guitarist, was like, you know, he was an ex bricky sure. and he was saying, "This is the hardest thing I've ever done." And it's, like, it's easier working on the building site, you know. But I think it was just the fact that so many people relied upon you doing well, you know. It's a big pressure, you know, and I think sometimes, you know, you felt as if you were losing it, you know, because 
lack of sleep, you know, excess of, uh, where, you know, excess of um, drinking, lack of sleep, uh, having to do interviews. I know why now big stars do one press conference. Because if you're talking all day like this, your voice starts to go. Yeah. You know, if I, I remember being in Los Angeles once, and I was like, they were saying, oh, we've got a few interviews lined up. And it was from 10 o'clock in the morning to 5 at night. And then I had to go and do a gig. And it was like, I was answering the same questions. Over and over. Seven hours, seven or eight different publications. And even now, you can tell, my voice is going a bit now, even just talking, you know. It's like, so, <clears throat> you know, it, it was, bri- and I'm not saying it was, it was a brilliant time, but everyone starts getting on each other's nerves and, yeah. you know, you start thinking, well, they're not doing, they're not pulling the weight, they're yeah. not pulling the weight, you know. And it, those, inevitably, those tensions uh, come to the fore, you know. Um, and also, when you're on tour, you can't be writing. So you're getting demands off record companies for the next single. But, you know, you need time to be able to write it, you know. And um, I think by 94, when we toured America, I really enjoyed that tour because I thought, this is our last tour. I'm not doing this again. I was just yeah, thinking. Yeah. Uh, so we, I decided to enjoy it rather than worry about it, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we had, had a brilliant time, that, that one, you know. Would that be right in saying this, Peter, and am I totally wrong here? And Was it around about 94, 95? Did you just do a cup final song for Everton as well? No, it wasn't me. No? What was the story? No, was Keith. Keith. Keith is, there's three Liverpoolians in the farm sure. and one Evertonian. That's about, I'd say, and I'm not joking here, that's probably the ratio, the ratio in the city, you know. I think so, right? Yeah. In the younger age group, it's probably even more, four to one maybe, you know. Right, okay. But, um, you know, and obviously you'll get people go on Facebook and Twitter and saying, oh, no, the People's Club, ever, and it's just absolute nonsense, you know. But, <laughs> but what can you say? They've never had a, Everton have never had a, a higher average attendance uh, than Liverpool since 1969. Right. You know, 20, 30 years before the tourists came, you know. So I think generally, you know, it's, anyway, three to one in the group. But Keats, the Evertonian, right, and uh, they got Everton. The people, people who do the players' pool, wanted to put out the cup final record, so they got session musicians in London to record it, and then asked the farm permission. And I said no, not because it was Everton. It wasn't. I, honestly, it wasn't. It was because they were changing the words. I didn't want the words changed, you know, because I didn't want to. Because that's your work, isn't it? It's like your baby. Yeah, I didn't want the words changed, but uh, in the end, Keith was on the phone and he had his lad in the background crying his eyes out. Oh, he was going to meet the team and goes down to Wembley with the team, you know. And in the end, I just asked me dad, I said to me dad, so what do you think? He go, well, it's about people, jo- enemies joining in no man's land. So if you don't let them have it, it's a bit hypocritical, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So in the end, we're like, all right, okay, you can have it. So I blame him. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't like the fact that the words were changed, you know. Yeah. Uh, and because um, the FA told me a few years later that they were going to use it for Euro 96 right. for the whole tournament. They were going to use it. You'd never have had three Lions. Really? Yeah. Put it together now. Right. We're going to use it for, but because Everton had used it, they, they, they went off the idea. Mm-hmm. So it costed not only did it cost us a fortune, and the funny thing is, players pool or the company that they set up to put out the record went into liquidation a few months after the cup final. So we mm-hmm. never got a penny. So we we didn't ask for an advance, you see, because it was Everton. Right. I think you'd usually ask for an advance. Say it was a small record company. But because Everton were fronting it and they'd hire the record company, thought, well... Oh, we'll get the money anyway. Yeah, we'll get... It's bound to get the money. Yeah. They went into liquidation and didn't pay us a penny, you know, so... That's terrible, eh? That's life, isn't it? But then, it, listen, you, you never got 96, but was it Euro 2004 that you released it? Yeah, we did, that's another thing we didn't want to do. There's really? things we, 
didn't want to do it. No, it wasn't supposed to be us. It was supposed to be Robbie Williams doing it. Really? Yeah. Really? The FA wanted Robbie Williams to cover all together now. I can't imagine you've been for that. And, and whatever, something happened. Either he didn't like the idea or he'd agreed to it and then couldn't find the time. I don't know what happened, but, but it was a crisis situation. Um, you know, two months before the record, uh, the, the Euro uh, 2004, the FA came to us and said, Robbie Williams can't do it or he won't do it, you know. And we said, uh, oh, yeah, well, okay, just release the original. Mm-hmm. Now we want you to do an updated version, you know. <laughs> and we're not big England fans by I'm any stretch. You, you often get scouts not English, isn't it? And a lot yeah. of England fans don't follow the national team. I've never supported the national team. Uh, not because of any political stance as such. I've just never supported the national team. I've always been a liberal fan. And I always regard England as London and yeah. small counties, you know, small small towns that attach themselves, you know. So I've never supported England. I haven't wished them, you know, to get hammered all the time either. You know, I'm not one of them, you know. Yeah. But if Scotland were playing England, I'd want the best team to win. Really? No. Oh, yeah. Whoever played best on the day. Yeah. Well, didn't really... Um, he didn't really concern me, you know. Mm. Uh, I wasn't, you know, I just wanted, say say it was 90 minutes, I wanted the opposition to equalise so there'd be extra time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And he couldn't, underst- he couldn't understand that, you know. Mm. Um, I had no, nothing in common with the England team and never supported them. And, you know, it was, it was, year, that was years before Scouts Not English, you know. Sure. Uh, that's more of a political thing, I think, you know, yeah. because of Pope's stature and, uh, Pope, you know, post uh, Hillsbury, you know. But, um, yeah, I mean, if if it's a World Cup, I usually want Brazil to win it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and what, uh, what, what about this, this song then, when this is just before it, you know? Uh, there, was a lo- there was a lot of um, debate in the band, let's put, call it that. Really, yeah. Some some didn't want to do it. Uh, me and Steve, who were the songwriters, were thinking, well, you know, we're not active as a group anymore. You know, we're not putting out records, so it's not going to damage our reputation as such because we haven't got it. You know, it's just that you know we're not we're not not an active band. You know, yeah. So we went down to the FA, and we met them all. That's all the suits and that. And they were convincing us it was a new perspective. It was an inclusive England. They were having, you know, uh, they wanted uh, all different cultures and all different, you know, uh, generations to support this idea, you know. And I think they convinced us, really, that they were genuine, you know. Uh, I think it was a bit of an act, myself, you know, because they promised us the world, like, there's going to be uh, gigs over in Portugal and Playing to 100,000 people at fan parks and all that. Nothing happened. No? <laughs> Nothing like that happened remotely. Like, uh, we, even had to, we even had to, you know, ask around for tickets, you know. Couldn't, they promised all sorts of tickets for games. Yeah. And all I that. think that would be a guarantee, isn't it? If you, you're putting yeah, your... but they were saying to us, like, for the video, um, can you get us some of the players? I said, what do you mean? Shut up. <laughs> You're Liverpool fan. You must know Carragher and people like that. I say, well, I know them, but you know, why can't you get them? Said, oh, we can't ask them. We've got to go through their agents or something, you know. That's so true. in the end, we never had any players in it. Yeah. We just had cardboard cutouts of the faces, you know. <laughs> That's right, yeah. But I mean, I think it's one of those tracks that it has been. I did a list once of the football teams who'd adopted it, and it's getting towards twenty football teams who've adopted it. Really? Germany had it in 2000. When was their World Cup? 2006. 2006. They did a version called Stronger yeah, Together. Right. They did a version and it got played at some of the matches. Really? Uh, called Stronger Together. Uh, Barrow adopted it. Really? Arsenal adopted it at one stage for some cup final and that, you know. Uh, Flamengo in Brazil. Yeah. Actually, one of, 
some lad who was at um, Seaman saw me in a pub one night in Liverpool and said, there, do you know Flamengo? That's their song. I went, what are you on about? He said, no, they're on... Where, where the um, he said I'm a, I'm a seaman. I went over to their like supporters club, and when all together now comes on, they all sing along and they've got their own words to it. That's mad. I did. Well, like I've never heard them singing it, you know. But I'm I'm willing to believe that. That must make you proud, though. Like a, a song that you've wrote like that, having such a, yeah. a lasting legacy across the world. You know, it's yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. It's been uh, it's been great for us, you know. It's been great for us, but um, you know, I, if I had my time again, I'd say I wouldn't have done the Everton song or the England song. You know, mm-hmm. uh, the England song was basically the original with the choir on it, so they didn't change the words. Right. But I don't know. We're not England fan, you know. It's I, it was a dichotomy there, you know. Mm-hmm. What's been your your most recent highlights, Peter? Obviously, not. not- not recent now, but obviously you don't buy the Sun yeah, Games and the, the Justice Collective stuff. And yeah, I think doing the Justice Tour was the highlight, mm-hmm. and doing the um, uh, He Ain't Heavy Christmas Number One. Yeah, uh, with Guy Chambers, you know, who was brilliant, uh, and he'd written songs with Robbie Williams. Believe it or not, you know, he was the main. He wrote um, a lot of his hits, you know. Right, but. Um, yeah, the Justice Tour was fantastic because uh, it was just an idea. Originally, it started off as a Don't Buy the Sun tour. Mm-hmm. Uh, but after talking to some of the Hillsborough people uh, who'd lost the Hillsborough Justice campaign, they said, well, it's not really about the sun. It's about justice for the 96. Yeah. So maybe you should change the, I, the title. So change the title to the Justice Tonight tour. Um, so the Don't Buy the Sun gig was originally in Liverpool and it was in September 2011. So that was before the independent panel report came out and before the inquest, of course, you know. So there was still that false narrative in the country that it was Liverpool fans were to, to blame, you know, and supporters were to blame. So I think it was important that the groups that got involved, we put this Don't Buy the Sun gig on. And James Dean Branfield was going to do it, but then eventually he couldn't do it because his wife had the baby of, of that week, in that week. But uh, one of my mates, Davo, who was in Big Audio Dynamite, but also a roadie for the Manic Street Preachers and the Stone Rose and other groups, uh, told Mick Jones about it. And Mick Jones said, I'll come up and do it, and that I'll mean, do Clash songs. Now, for him to do Clash songs meant it was a big deal. Yeah. Because he said... And he was talking to us in the rehearsal and he said, uh, we, I never do class songs now. For, I only do them if I think Joe would want me to do them. Mm-hmm. I said, and Joe would have wanted me to do this because it's about an injustice, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the it was a... F- the, the, the night we did in Liverpool at the Olympia, it was a great night, but it was like a political rally. It was almost like going back to the poll tax days, you know, where people were energised and politicised. Tom Watson was invited up because the Labour Party conference was the next day. Well, Tom Watson at the time was taking on the murder campaign. That's right, we didn't yeah. know what he'd turn out to be. But at the time, it looked like he was he was taking on authority. So he came and did, done a speech. Len McCluskey, the head of United, did a speech. Uh, Steve Rotherham, who was an MP for Walton at the time, did a speech. He's the Metro Mayor now. So we had all these political speeches and all these bands on. Uh, John Power from Cash did it. Excellent. Uh, the Farm did it. Uh, also, we had the Justice Night Band, which was Pete Wiley, uh, three songs, The Farm, three of songs, and then seven or eight class songs, you know. And it was such a success. Everyone come out of it saying, it can't just stop there. Something else is going to happen. The next day, we were in town having our breakfast and Mick, Mick Jones came in, he'd stayed in the drummer's house um, and he said, uh, I want to take this on tour. So it's like a football team. That's That was the pre-season friendly. That's the way he talked. That was the pre-season friendly. I want to take it around, uh, the, you know, the UK and then we'll go into Europe. And that's what he was talking like. Mm-hmm. And then it was really through Davo that all the groups got involved. 
because he was a roadie for them. I think he was on the phone some more. He he was actually in rehearsals with the Stone Roses, and he must have been asking them about them, you know. Right. So they said, "Oh, we want to do something." They just sold out three, three days, three nights at Heaton Park. So that's uh, two hundred forty thousand tickets in about an hour or two hours or so. That was their big comeback show as well, wasn't it? It was. It was, but they did. Ah, oh, that was in. That was in June, July 2012, but they went on stage with us in November 2011 Amazing. to do a couple of songs. They did Bank Robber yeah. and uh, a Rosa song, and it was only in a venue in Manchester, 1,000 capacity. Amazing. But it was brilliant, brilliant, special moment, you know. Mm-hmm. And then we did Glasgow uh, with Las Vegas. Yeah. Then we did the uh, first gig we did was with in Cardiff and James Dean Bradfield got up for that. Right. Uh, so we do a, one of his own songs and, and a cover. And he did Come Back by Wiley, you know. Excellent. Wherever you we went, with Richard Hawley and Reverend the Makers in Sheffield. Then in London, it was um, Primal Scream. Yeah. And ex-members of The Clash got up as well, Paul Simonon. Unbelievable time, you know. It was, it was like a, it was like Mick Jones, like the Pied Piper. He was like, he was like it was almost like what was happening with Jeremy Corbyn in 2017, you know. Yeah. It was like a, people were just following him, you know, mm-hmm. and energized by it, you know. And I think um after that, the Stone Roses then said, you know, because it was a great success, you know, uh, Stone Rose then said, Will you come on a few gigs with us in in the, in the summer? Uh, and we did, and we played Leon. Eric Cantona and I got up for that. That's amazing. Did, should I stay or should I go? <laughs> Was he singing? Uh, singing, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah uh, and um, I, someone said to me, someone said to me before the gig, he said, oh, he's only doing this because Mick Jones is uh, producing his, his, his partner. Right. He's a singer, you know. So I thought I'd better ask him, you know, to see his... I said, uh, do you realise... What are you getting involved in tonight? And he gave me a big speech about it. Also. He knew all about it. And he went, it's a massive injustice. Mm-hmm. And he, have you ever seen Football Rebels by Cantona? Have you ever seen that? I've not seen it, no. Oh, it's brilliant. See, it's on, you can get it on YouTube. Right. The one on Socrates is absolutely brilliant. Mm-hmm. How footballers use their fame to go against uh, injustice. And, right, okay. And I think Cantona, he introduces it. He was definitely in that mode, can't I? And that's yeah, a man like legend, you know, doing something about Hillsborough. And... Well, that's it. Yeah. So yeah. in many ways, it was exactly the same sentiments as all together now, you know, yeah. really. Um, and uh, it only made the Liverpool Echo and the Manchester Evening News. That's you know, the paper mentioned it. Yeah. If I'd have tripped them up on stage or pushed them over. <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it was a great, because there was no bad news, it never made the news, you know. But for me, a story like that is important. Yeah. You know, it never really, you can you, you can Google it now and there's not much references to it. You know? It might be a BBC reference that was online. Yeah, I think on stage singing The Clash is surely national newspaper stuff, isn't it? You know, I would have thought so. Yeah. But, you see, Hillsborough still... A, it was before the independent panel report come out, so there were people like that, probably the newspaper editors, oh, no, Touch it. get on with it, you know, get, get over that with it, mm. you know. But you can't get over something when you know there's an injustice. So mm. it wasn't until the independent panel report came out in September 2012, which was after Heaton Park, yeah. and after um, we'd done the, the gigs, that it, you know, the truth was established. We knew the truth, but the truth for the society was established. And then when the inquest came, 2016, I think it was, they finished, and it was like all 14 points. Mm-hmm. Fans were exonerated and the authorities were to blame. And we knew that all along. We knew this. I think even taking it up to the modern day, though, Peter, it doesn't seem to me like justice has been done. You know, it's... Well, it depends what you mean by justice. You know, a lot of people would say that the inquests 
or justice. Yeah. It's whether you want revenge. It's, I don't know. It's I can't speak for the family, so I'd never attempt to, you know, but for me, the establishment in law of the truth is a form of justice. Um, now, I can understand people thinking, well, people have got away with it. No one's actually served one night in prison for it, you know. Is an injustice, and I can I can I can uh, sympathise with that view, but for me, um, you know, the truth is justice. If you do, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Duck and Field was tried, uh, and he was found not to be solely responsible, and I can understand that because he wasn't solely responsible. There's a whole group of people around him who were culpable, yeah. who didn't help him on the day. There's a long story about that, that he was he was fast-tracked in and he got the job ahead of other people because uh, Brian Mole, who should have been doing the game, was uh, one of his staff was involved in a prank yeah. and he was put on garden leave. It was a prank for someone's 21st and the armed police... Uh, Jumped out of cars and got him with balaclavas on. Right. I never yeah. Heard. Down a back alley. Right. He thought he was getting robbed. Then he took the balaclavas off and said, ah, 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 it's us. And it was police done. And it, it was to a, a policeman's son or someone, you know, Douglas Haid found out about it. So he put uh, Hamilton Road, which is the police station for Hillsborough, on, on um, Brian Mole, who did all the matches there. They put him on. Uh, garden and leave, you know. Right. And if you really read into it, you can tell that Duckenfield was brought in, and it's university good. educated, fast tracked in. They didn't like him. Mm-hmm. The staff didn't like him. No one at the ground seemed to like him. Sure. And I think on the day, everyone just went like that. You know, when he was looking for what they were doing now, what, I think they were thinking, he's going to fuck this up. And he's going to fuck it up so bad they'll never do another game. Not wanting people to die, obviously, of course. Yeah. But that's that was the consequence of it. You know? mm-hmm. And I suppose you know, and we started off on it, and I suppose we'll end off on it. It's uh, it's been some terrible times over the years, but Liverpool's back, and we can only look forward to the the future. And what, what's what's in the future for the Spirit of Shankly, yourself, and and Liverpool fans in general? Um, Spirit of Shankly, we still dealing with the club. I think it's become now, we're even on their press releases now. Brilliant. You know, he went through this idea of having football forums, um, community forums and different, you know, but I don't think they were working. You know, I think they realised the spirit of Shankly uh, at a cross-section of supporters and we try and do things in it. We're a supporters union. That's what we are. So, if there's any ticket issues, you know, that we get involved in them and say, what have you tried this idea? And so they see it like as a, um, you know, the club, they know we're not going away, you know. We've been going for like 12 years now, you know, and, uh, and we were campaigning for, uh, you know, various things. But what the most recent thing would be was being a fan update. There's, 27,000 seasons here at Alders Anfield. But they reckon a big percentage of them are dead. You know, just yeah. being passed on. Yeah. Oh, so they're being passed on to family, you know. Yeah. So they're trying to establish who actually owns the season ticket. So we've been involved in that process and trying to help people out because a lot of people are struggling. Like I had to do my dad's. My dad's, you know, still got a season ticket. and He's in his 90s, you know. Yeah. So... I had to do it for him because, you know, he's not online as such. You know, He's online a bit, but he's got an email address, but yeah. he would not upload a photograph. I did it. It took me two minutes to do, you know, but you can imagine people, the windows are shut at the ground. You can't get one-to-ones to do it. Yeah. People want to pay cash and they can't pay, you know, so there's all sorts of problems. But So we're liaising with the club you know, on various things, you know. Um, so the spirits of Shankly, I think, it's still in, still still have an important role, you know. Yeah, sure do. They found but representation, you know. I'd imagine at first, Peter, they thought he's were a bit of a pain in the arse, and now they're realising that he's aren't going away, and you're making a difference. 
Yeah, I think so. And also, as I said before, there's people at the club who think genuinely these mean they're not doing it to empire build, you know. Yeah. It's not the corridors of power being, you know, um, seduced by the corridors of power. Yeah. They're doing it because do you think it's the right thing to do, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I had the Boot Room Boys book out 18 months ago, so that's still going fine. Um, check that out. Where's the best place to buy it? Well, uh, probably a local independent bookshop, I'd say. Mm. Have you seen the cover of it? I have, but if you've got it there, let's see it for those that are watching. Yeah, I've got one here. So, and it's really how, um, you know, one, one's... One legend, one Scottish hero came, and that's the book. But it's about the determination um, of Bill Shankly to transform the club in his image. And that's what it is now. The the lineage is there, you know. Um, It's been broken a few times over the years, but Shankly created a dynasty which Paisley went on to... uh, and Fagan, and then Daglish. And it was really, I think, Sooners gets the blame. I think it was Daglish himself. I think he was responsible for a lot of the demise of Liverpool, ironically, you know, yeah. because I think he was trying to modernise the club, you know. He, get, he did away with the boot room, really. Sooners gets the blame. And Sooners gets the blame for, like, because the Premier League wanted a media room. And the, the media room was, um, I was just, I'm trying to find a photo, but I, um, the media room was the, was the old boot room. That was the only position he could have, you know. And um, so that's the photograph of the boot room. Yeah. That's the last photograph of the boot room. Um, exactly. There's the old boots in there and it's getting, and that was demolished under under Sooners' reign. So he gets the blame for the boot room, but by the time Sooners took over, the club was going downhill. There was no youngsters coming through. The, the signs had been terrible. When Sooners arrived there, uh, I think he was warned by Alan Hansen. He said, it's not like when you left. You know, there's hardly any players here. There's only John Barnes. <laughs> you, know, have you, on, you know, that's what he said, basically. Yeah. What had happened in um, 86 is uh, Daglishan, um, asked Jeff Twentyman, the scout, to uh, to leave because yeah. he had a bad back. He was fifty five. He was the best scout in Europe. Regarded, he bought everyone from Clemens to Keegan to Rush. To Dag- everyone, he was the one who got them. You know, he was asked to leave, and uh, uh, soon as found out about it, and got him up to Rangers. Really, yeah. So he was the scout at Rangers when Rangers when Rangers started doing well in Europe. Yeah. Some of the buyers were people that Jeff Twentyman had recommended. You know, he said you should buy him. You should buy him. You know, mm-hmm. and he recommended people like Mark Walters, I think. Mm-hmm. But then people would say to him, "Well, Mark Walters ended up getting, playing for Liverpool." He said, "Yeah, well, twenty. I wouldn't have recommended him for Liverpool, but he suited Rangers." Do you know what I mean? So. It's whether, but I think if 20 minutes had stayed on, uh, Liverpool's scouting wouldn't have dropped off a cliff. Yeah. So we wouldn't be in a position we were when Sooners took over, you know? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I could have put that in, I could have spelt that out in the book, uh, but it wouldn't make me that popular. <laughs> but I think if you read the book, you'll understand that that's the watershed moment, summer of 86. Now, Liverpool went on to play brilliant football up until, you know, Daglish left, really, yeah. 91. But there's, There was changes uh, coming over. That well, people, they, they weren't buying the right players. They were buying yeah. terrible players. And um, Ron Yeats took over as head of scouting. You know, great player, great character of the club, a legendary player for Liverpool Football Club. But he'd never done any scouting in his life. Never. But he used to play golf with Kenny. Right. So, do you know what I mean? That's where you think, 
you know. Jobs for the boys almost. Well, yeah, and I think Kenny said, uh, I don't go in the boot room anymore because, well, I, I'm not going in the boot room, he said. I'm not clever enough. Which you think to yourself, that's a bit of a, a snub, wasn't it, really? But what he did do is he got, uh, he said all he wanted in his new office, and this is when he took over as manager, is a bar, like one of them bars with the optics on. Optics, yeah. Because he was, wants to invite the managers into his 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 room. After the game. His man, after the game, yeah. not the boot room. Right. So I think there's a bit of mythology that soon as dismantle the boot room. I think it I think it was that leash, you know. Yeah. That's interesting. Any any gigs coming up, Peter? Any any music in the pipeline? Yeah. We had fifteen festivals lined up. Yeah. Uh, Are they postponed till next year or will you be doing yeah. the next year? Good. We'll postpone till next year. And if they're outdoors, I think if you're outdoors and your arms length away from people, it'll be all right next year, presumably. Yeah. Uh, it's just whether indoor gigs happen, you know. Sure. Uh, but it's one of those things, you know. It's not until it's taken away that you miss it, is it really? Yeah. It's like people used to moan about too much football on telly. And <laughs> I said during the pandemic, during the height of lockdown, I'll never moan about too much footy on the telly ever again. Yeah. You know? yeah. Once it comes because, back, it'll come back bigger and better and, and stronger as well. And that's for music yeah. and football, isn't it? When is it? I mean, they've said the Premier League are starting on September the 12th and then they said there might be concerts in the autumn. Yeah. But they might be socially distanced concerts, I don't know. But I think by next summer, I think festivals, as long as the, you know, uh, the certain measures put in place, I think they'll allow festivals to happen, you know. Good. Any north of the border, any up in Scotland? There were, there were a few, yeah, a couple, mm. I think, yeah. Um, I have to wait and see if they're still on next year I don't know you know exactly. well, so we look forward to seeing you there Peter. yeah okay it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much for your time and uh, thanks to everyone that's yeah. listened to this episode of the podcast uh, you can get Peter online get the farm online as well uh, and if you've not done so already uh, please subscribe to this podcast as well cheers <laughs>